Of course, for India, thorium is important because we don't have too much of uranium. Conversely, India has massive thorium deposits and almost no uranium. India has been pursuing a solid fuel-based thorium breeder since 1950, with steadfast determination of securing energy independence. Most of that time, they've been looking at you know thorium oxide fuels, solid fuels, and they're running the same challenges with solid fuel thorium that everybody does. And I have been told informally uh, through friends of this person that, that one of the former directors of the Indian nuclear program, when asked, if you had it all to do again, what would you differently? He said, I would have gone to molten salt right from the beginning. Dr. Sina and his colleagues think that molten salt breeder reactor, am I quoting you correctly, Sennaji? <laughs> I heard you telling me some time back that they think that the molten salt breeder reactor seems to be the most suitable candidate for the self-sustainable thorium reactor. What I think is amazing about molten salt technology is the fact that the thorium fuel cycle integrates so cleanly with the technology. The advantage for the molten salt is that, that processing is much simpler and it reduces the fuel cycle costs and makes a breeder uh, a conceivable economic proposition. Liquid fuel enables economic thorium breeding thanks to liquid chemistry and thanks to liquid homogeneity of the fuel. You can use thorium in existing reactors, but the economics aren't there to support it. In addition, liquid fuel's homogeneity can also enable more efficient consumption of uranium as well. With an MSR, those degrees of freedom, that soup, if you will, in a molten liquid state, permits the complete usage of the fissile materials, whether they be thorium or uh, uranium or what have you. So in principle, you could make a molten salt reactor using pure uranium. There's nothing wrong with that. To compete with thorium breeding levels of efficiency, a uranium-fueled reactor would need to overcome some additional challenges. But even the incremental improvements possible by using similar molten salt reactors fueled with uranium would allow us to extract additional energy from our existing stockpiles of spent fuel. Leslie Dewan is co-founder and chief science officer of Transatomic Power. She's one of Time's 30 people under 30 changing the world. And so you and a friend. Mark Massey, right after we finished our qualifying exams, we figured that this was the smartest we were going to be for a while. Mark and I started thinking very broadly just about nuclear reactors in general. So we looked at the six types of Gen 4 reactors. We got our inspiration by looking at the molten salt reactor. Our fuel is a liquid. We can leave it in a reactor for as long as it takes to extract essentially all of the remaining energy in it. The commercial regulatory structure in the U.S. is currently set up only for light water reactors. The uncertainty in the estimates of the cost and timeline effectively block large-scale private investment in new nuclear reactors because no, no investor would, would want to put money into a project if they don't have a good sense of when they're going to get a return or how much it'll cost at the beginning. The NRC regulations specifically spell out prohibitions against fluid-filled reactors. Even for national laboratories, uh, you cannot operate fluid-filled reactor more than one megawatt without expensive licensing process running at about $150. Uh, dollars per man hour. The NRC trusts sophomores in college more with light water reactors than they do national lab scientists with fluid fueled reactors. It's been there for ages since Milton Shaw. Yes, Shaw is the one who actually decided that we weren't going to do liquid fueled reactors. He instituted the catch 22. We can't do work on molten salt reactors because we just don't know enough about how molten salt reactors work. Well, can we find out how they work? No, because we don't know how they work. It's like, what? So it's a demonstration reactor cutoff for liquid-fueled reactors is maybe one megawatt thermal versus 10 megawatts thermal for solid-fueled reactors. We'd like the demonstration facility to generate meaningful results for a full-size plant on the order of 20 megawatts thermal. Any smaller than that, and it really... It becomes a different machine. Yeah, but just the, the thermal hydraulics even would be so different that it wouldn't really be a valid comparison. You know, the state of Missouri uh, passed a resolution that they want to be the first state to have thorium molten salt reactors in their state. 
every state with reactors has their own nuclear regulatory commission and there's a provision where they can literally go off on their own. It's just like highway funds. If you don't approve drunk driving level of 0.08, it's like, oh, you can do that, Wisconsin. You can do that, Illinois. Say goodbye to $500 million in highway funds, though, if you do that. So, so they, they hold a gun to their heads to do that. Same thing with the NRC. But it would be an extraordinary wake-up call for once, if even one state did it, where if one state was just like, you guys are so out of sync with what current nuclear technology is that we absolutely have to, for the health of our state, go on our own. That, that, that would be, the NRC I'm sure would have, have great retribution is, the, not my word, somebody else's, I, I thought that was the, when, when we discussed that, somebody was like, that would bring down great retribution. Right. And I'm like, I'm sure the great retribution would come down, but at some point someone would be like, hey, why did this state go off on its own and put up with this gigantic, huge penalty they paid, you know? Why would they do that? And, uh, and maybe it would become a national conversation, and certainly in the decision-making halls of power, they'd be like, has something gone so off the rails here that one state is essentially in one little way willing to secede from the union on this? The current system incentivizes reactor designers to develop their first projects outside of the United States. And in fact, this has already happened. Some existing nuclear reactor design companies are planning on building their first power plants overseas in Canada or China or the Philippines because they don't think it will be possible to build an advanced reactor in the U.S. under the current regulatory system. We have chosen the Canada for a very specific reason. Um, we have a completely new reactor system with a completely uh, um, profoundly different risk profile. Canada has a, f uh, a fundamentally different regulatory environment for nuclear power, which is, I would say, very progressive. We do feel that we have a competitive advantage by pursuing this technology in Canada, specifically. Currently, there is no way for us to build a prototype facility or move beyond the laboratory-scale work that we're currently doing. We want more than anything to do this in the U.S., but we've been forced to keep an open mind with respect to the other, the other pathways we could take. China is building a supply chain in order to manufacture and distribute molten salt reactors, and we are not. We don't do big science anymore here in the United States. We don't. China is, India is, the Czech Republic is. Jan Ulich, he's got a great budget, and he just bought an obscene amount of fly for pennies on the dollar from Oak Ridge National Laboratories because he's doing big science over there. And we, we basically gave it away. Anything that's different, that's never been done before, it seems like in the nuclear field, everybody wants to be number two. This is one of the flaws with, that, that has impeded innovation in the nuclear energy technology area, which is that this is a first mover barrier. Because quite obviously, once the answer comes out as to how NRC will manage that sort of question, Everybody knows what that answer is, and, and everybody else can free ride. On the other hand, the, the benefits that come from the switch to molten salts, even if we're using uranium at the same rate that you would with light water reactors, are substantial. And what we can learn using solid fuel and what we can develop uh, can be readily applied to build liquid fueled reactors as well. Ornell and Berkeley's respective pebble bed designs both make great use of molten salt to offer passive safety. This is a drain tank. That's the drain tank. To drain it back down again, and we've done that a couple of times already. And eliminate the challenge of high pressure operation. If you had a little crack on this and it was sort of, it was starting to weep, it forms a plug. Self-plugging. Nice Self-plug. Yeah, That's a nice thing, not being under pressure. In fact, these reactors are intended to be modular and factory produced. We are very interested in a transportable size of these for some of the things like supporting individual refineries or remote power operations. Ultimately, a much less expensive source of energy than today's reactors. There's vigorous debates that go on about what is the best and fastest path to get this technology developed. And I think that you know it's good for us to have those debates and it's good for 
parallel efforts in multiple areas to be underway. The effort on the solid fuel side I think is important is that, that we, we can target achievable goals that, where we can reach certain milestones in a shorter period of time uh, on the solid fuel side. Mm -hmm. There's just fewer hoops you need to loop through. Pebble fuel is fairly well understood. It's been, it's been being used since like the 70s now. Well, you know, the, the next best thing that scales up after molten salt science is fluoride-cooled solid fuels. So, if molten salt pebble bed reactors can be passively safe and less expensive, why is every single organization shown here investigating, if not dedicating themselves entirely, to the pursuit of liquid fuel? There's supreme advantages of dissolving the fuel and fish products in the fluorides because you can add and subtract at will. Solid stuff is always going to be expensive fabrication. And what do you do with the spent pebbles? They have an inner carbon core surrounded by a triso matrix, surrounded by an outer layer of graphite. Every time we defuel a pebble, you can actually assay these pebbles using gamma ray spectroscopy to uh, discern how, what the burn up is of this pebble and whether it should be placed back into the core or whether it should be put in storage. Then what do you do with the spent pebbles? There was that much more manufacturing and engineering and thought going into these pebbles. But ultimately, from a macroscopic or 50,000 foot view, you still have the same waste problem. Except it's now in a far more engineered and therefore much more difficult medium in which to go extract that waste and process it. Well, it's a lot easier to deal with the chemistry if you don't dilute the fuel into the salt. Chemistry is not, chemistry is not difficult to deal with. Just think about the problems and solve them. Um, I, w I would pose this question. What is easier? Running a liquid past a solid in order to transfer the heat or having the, the, the fuel be a liquid and use that in and of itself. So I would argue that, that actually combining the two is easier. Sure, it's more chemistry, but so what? I'm a chemist. <laughs> there are lots and lots of chemists you know, on the planet. And a lot of them are a hell of a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> so like, go solve the problem. Oh, wait a second. Oak Ridge already solved the problem from 1951 to 1974.